So, welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah. And as we gather, um, we are reminded that we are hosting this webinar on land that is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Neutral peoples. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening Waterloo Region, Ontario, and Canada. And we are grateful for the opportunity to be here and reaffirm our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. We also acknowledge that people are joining us from across Turtle Island. Uh, now for some general uh, information um, on how we're going to run this chat. We ask that everyone stays on mute. Um, and with if you have your video off, it, unless you're talking, it, except for you, David, it sort of helps with the bandwidth connection sometimes. Um, and back, background noises can really be amplified with the online communication. Uh, we are recording the meeting and we hope to post it on YouTube. If you're uncomfortable with that, then please let us know. Uh, Matt, Stacy, and the other organizers and myself are Green Party volunteers. Uh, we do not work or represent the Green Party. There have been no staff or candidates involved in the organizing. Um, and we're doing this to strengthen the Green Party. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, please let uh, Matt know um, in the chat uh, he uh, has the co-host function um, and please put a brief summary of the question and we'll attempt to allow you to ask the question in the order received but we may skip some people that have a broader range of questions asked or um, and when it's your turn I'll call on you and you can ask the question if several people have questions on one topic we may try to combine them um, I'm also er, uh, going to post some information about upcoming meetings with the other candidates in the chat. Uh, and we are planning on having all the candidates together in September. Um, and some of the important dates that are coming up too, and this is going in the chat as well. August 14th is the last day to request a mail-in ballot if you want a paper ballot. If you're planning on doing online ballot, you don't need to do anything that's default if you are a member you need to be uh, a member as of september 30th to vote um, so if you're not a member yet uh, please do that uh, september 26th is when vote online voting begins so you will get your the ballot um, either that day or the day before uh, with instructions on how to cast it and october 3rd is when voting ends um, with that, I'll turn uh, the microphone over to Kitchener Center's 2019 uh, candidate, Mike Morris. Hey everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes. How's the connection? Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks, Teresa. David. So wonderful to be here. Thanks so much for making time to be with us. And uh, from David, um, David uh, Rush actually ran for the, the, the election, and uh, I'm so encouraged that uh, he decided to join the race alongside uh, nine others. Uh, David ran in a riding out on Vancouver Island, and uh, did. Uh, a very similar results to what we received in, in Kitchener Center. Um, and, uh, and I'm really glad he's um, made the decision to, to run. And I think you'll see has a, an approach that uh, really reflects uh, the party well. Um, so again, thanks to all of you for, for making time to, to be with us. I'll be on these um, uh, for the coming nine uh, weeks we'll be having them. As you'd like to hear, join for as many as you'd like. Uh, but for right now, I will uh, turn it to David. David, welcome to Waterloo Region, virtually at least. Uh, wonderful to have you, have you here. 
Thanks very much, Mike. I really appreciate that kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Teresa, as well, for all the organizing. Um, we had a group that was on another Zoom link, but I think most of them have come over. So we're all together now, and I'm really glad to, to be with you all. I'm coming to you from the south end of Vancouver Island, uh, the riding of Esquimalt Saanich Souk. And we're in the traditional territory of the Esquimalt, the Wissanik, the Souk, the Songhees, and the Sequent First Nations. That's really a, a meaningful thing for me, not just a routine thing to say. I went into law as a young lawyer because I really believe that uh, serious wrongs had been done throughout our history to Indigenous people. And the law was a way to address that through litigation and legislation. I see those wrongs continuing to be done. My first job in law was on a reserve in Alberta, uh, working with a lawyer named Willie Littlechild, who um, really fought for Indigenous rights in Geneva and in our courts. And it's something that's near and dear to my heart. I live here in Saanich with uh, my wife, Anna Meek. Uh, we met over a legal opinion at the Department of Justice in Ottawa many years ago. And we have four daughters. One of them is at home still. Rebecca, our youngest, um, is going into grade 12. I'll be very brief in this introduction. I'm going to talk about my vision for Canada, for the Green Party, and what I have to offer. And then I'll throw it open to everybody for questions. The questions and answers are always the most interesting part. And I really look forward uh, to your questions. No question is unfair, so feel free just to go ahead. For Canada, ce que je vois, c'est un pays bilingue où il faut un leader qui est bilingue aussi et un parti vert qui est complètement bilingue. I'd also like to see a Green Party where we are a leader on climate action. It's critical for us because time is so short that Canada leads around the world on the transition of fossil fuels, on the building of a green economy, on moving on to renewable energy, uh, building an east-west grid backed up by battery power. It's important for us to make this transition quickly because the science is clear. We are facing an urgent climate disaster and we need to move right now. I also think it's really important that we move in a way that leaves no one behind. Social justice is one of our core green principles, our six green values, and we must make this transition in a way that enables everyone to come along with the economy. Right now we have an economy that has a growing gap between the rich and everybody else, and we need to be able to fix that, and the Green Party has fantastic policy to do that with our guaranteed livable income, free tuition, national pharmacare, a national daycare strategy. We are the most progressive party in Canadian politics and elected politics in the House of Commons. And we need to stand up for that. Uh, and I believe it's core to who we are as Greens. This brings me to my second point. I don't think we're going to make this transition in Canada unless we have a really strong green presence in the House of Commons to hold the government's feet to the fire, and then ideally over time to form a government. If we can't form a government, then perhaps we can do like we have here in British Columbia, form the balance of power. Because to do that, we need seats. We need to build in 338 ridings across Canada. We need to enable people in winnable seats. Um, and your area is one of our most winnable areas. I campaigned for Mike Schreiner in Guelph on his winning campaign. We came and worked for two weeks, uh, my daughter, son-in-law, um, and another person from our riding. And we can see that uh, uh, the, the um, central Ontario, um, western, uh, south central Ontario, the whole eastern Ontario too, I see seats in eastern Ontario, especially francophone seats, Quebec, New Brunswick, as being potential areas of growth for us. And we really need to focus on those areas of growth and put in the energy. And that is critical for us if we're going to change the course of Canadian politics, is winning seats on the ground. I say this uh, very uh, humbly, but I don't think it's just about leadership. It's also about our followers. And I'm a real believer in building up our EDAs and empowering our volunteers. It's not just about the leader. And if every person on this call went and sold one Green Party membership. We have, let me see, over 25, any, over 25 people on this call. 
if everybody on these calls that we're having across the country went and sold one membership to a neighbor, a friend, a family member, a work colleague, we would double the vote in the Green Party. And that would be transformational right there. And then if every riding goes and calls, it's people who took lawn signs in the last campaign and just said, thank you very much for taking a long time. We appreciate that you said to your neighbors that you were on board with the Green Party. And would you join the Green Party for $10 and vote on the most important decision facing the Green Party in the last 14 years? And that is who's going to be the next leader of the Greens. That's what I think we need to do on the ground right now to transform the Green Party. And then we need a leader who can actually win his seat. We came a close second in my riding last time. Next time we are going to win in a Squamalt Sandwich Souk. And I think it's very important to have a leader who can actually win the seat they ran in in the 2019 campaign. If we elect a leader who can't win a seat, we have a new problem to solve in the Green Party. Secondly, I think it's critical to have a leader who's perfectly fluent in English and French, who can campaign on the doorsteps in French. I've done that across the country. I did that in Memramcook, Tantramar, New Brunswick. We won that seat by 11 votes. Megan Mitten, fantastic candidate. And the reason she won that seat for the uh, New Brunswick legislature was because she knocked on doors for six months. And I'm a true believer in knocking on doors convincing people on their doorsteps to vote green. I think that's a formula. That's the Mike Schreiner formula. That was my formula in the last election. I started in December, 2018, knocked on doors all the way through to the October election. So I'm really keen on having a leader who can do that in both official languages and who's really ready to put in the hard work. Barack Obama says, politics is 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration. And I believe that it's about hard work on the ground, somebody who's really ready to campaign hard in every riding across Canada to get Greens elected. Here's the last thing I'll say about me and then I'll turn it over to questions. I have worked in two shadow cabinet positions, the justice critic and as democratic reform critic. I understand the Green Party from working with the federal council, working with Elizabeth May, who's my next door neighbor here in, in Saanich, and working on the ground, I'm the only candidate who crossed the country in February and March to meet with riding associations in every province. I made it as far as Montreal before COVID-19 struck. I was actually on my way to see you back through Ontario and I got stopped in Coburg, Ontario, and so couldn't see you in person, even though I had meetings lined up with riding associations and university greens uh, throughout Ontario. But I hope to come back in August and September because I really believe that a leader who pays attention to the grassroots, who gets out and knocks on doors with people, who listens to people on the front lines of our party is the kind of leader we build, we, we need. We, we, we need to build the party with that kind of leadership and that's what I offer. So if you go to davidmerner.com, you'll see two important buttons. One is volunteer and the other is donate. And if you have time to take a look at davidmerner.com, this travel is expensive. Uh, I love your support financially. No donation is too small, but better yet, if you're able to donate some time to do some phoning for us or do some travel planning or some writing for our communications team, we'd love to have you on board. Thank you for coming on uh, today. I really appreciate you joining me. Uh, thank you again for the organizers. Uh, let's turn it over to questions. Hey, uh, Julianne. Uh, you have uh, the first uh, question, if you want to ask. Uh... Sure, that's what I'm afraid of, I thought. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's, there's other people you just got your... <laughs> I'm okay. Um, David, I, I, I worked for the Greens before, just to preface that. Uh, I'm also a family, what, I, what, I, we, what I've been coining is essential family caregiver in long-term care, and it's a disaster. Uh, I also want to know your, and I can send a, a follow-up email later, but the Long-Term Care Act, as it should, a long-term care as part of the Canada Health Act or its own separate piece, but it has to be national. And I'd just like to get your thoughts on that when I hear the, the argument that it's provincial jurisdiction. True enough that it is, that's on the delivery of it, but not on the spirit of the act. Um, also, that... I just want to focus on the environment, uh, not the, the environment, but on on the damage done to the economy as a result of poor leadership writ large. 
what are we going to do or what are you thinking? Because I think it's going to be an economic disaster after the money's out. There's no more money. Thanks, for now. Julian. Thank you for the questions, Julian. I really appreciate that. On your first question about long-term care, I really do think we need a total review across Canada of how our long-term care facilities are being managed, how they're being regulated, and also we need to look at the ownership structures. I do think there's a very good argument, and I think you alluded to this, that if we have private sector ownership, uh, the, the pressure is to drive down costs and increase profits. And that means driving down standards of care and cutting corners, uh, cutting staffing levels and so on. So I think it's a really serious question you asked. Um, I think the key is regulation. You suggested we should uh, look at a national uh, framework for this. The Canada Health Act would be a very good framework and the federal government's jurisdiction here is through the spending power. Uh, and so if the federal government is stepping up to help this sector recover, and become a much safer sector, then it has a lot of influence in how the services are delivered. Health is a provincial jurisdiction, but the federal government does have a serious role here. And a lot of it is about how do we set regulations and enforce regulations. In Australia, the national government has jurisdiction and they can actually delist, decertify uh, long-term care facilities very easily. They did it 19 times last year and Canada, in Canada, it's ha never happened. Um, in Ontario or in BC, because the teeth aren't there for the inspectors. So that's a bit of a long answer, but that's how I handle that, Julian. I look forward to your email on that. Yeah. Thank uh, you. And as far as the economy goes, Julian, uh, I agree with you. I think we're facing a serious uh, risk in terms of our recovery. I think that uh, the guaranteed livable income that we've always campaigned on as Greens is the foundation for the recovery. If Trudeau had come in on day one and brought in the guaranteed livable income rather than the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, we would be way ahead. He wouldn't be walking out to the microphone fixing the holes in that safety net every day. Um, we would have had a much more universal, much more fair and much less expensive program than the Canada Emergency Resp Response Benefit. I'm a real fan of that program as the foundation stone, but then we need to go beyond that. We need to go with the largest job creation strategy in Canadian history. And that's the East-West electrical grid that we campaigned on last time, powered by renewables. We need to really focus on moving off fossil fuels and onto renewables. And that's gonna require not just the East-West electricity, electricity grid, but also battery farms. That technology has evolved so much in Australia and California. We know how to do it. It's being done in other countries. Let's do it in Canada and let's campaign in our next campaign as having the most ambitious job creation program in Canadian history since the building of the National Railway. If we come forward with a positive, inspiring economic plan like that, we're going to win seats. Thanks, Julian, for your questions. I appreciate the two questions. I'll send in a, an email and a couple of things. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ingrid, I believe you have a question. Okay, um, my question is to you, David, um, how will you attract young Greens to the party? Do you have a plan? I do, um, Ingrid. I, and I love that question, Ingrid. I think it's a fantastic question. It's critical to the future of the Green Party. I agree. And uh, so I have a plan that I've already implemented once, and I'm the only candidate in the race to do that, Ingrid. We implemented it here in Esquimalt Senate Souk last summer. We brought in 25 young Greens uh, from across Canada, PEI, Nova Scotia, everywhere between there and uh, BC. And we said to the young Greens, we will billet you. We have a bed for you at night. We will feed you breakfast. And then when you come into the campaign office, you can have lunch and dinner here with us and campaign with us. And if you need a part-time job, we will link you up to part-time employment if you need to earn money as well. And we had 25 fantastic young Greens. We had more than we could accommodate come from across the country. They designed their own program. They called it Paint the Island Green. Uh, and they took over our social media feed, especially Instagram got way better as soon as they arrived. And they totally energized our, our ground game, our door knocking game. Uh, they started coming in May. Uh, by June, they were all here. And we created this fantastic energy. And not only that, they reached out to young, young Greens across South Vancouver Island. 
and brought in other young Greens, partly through their social events, <laughs> uh, but also because they were out on the doors, door knocking. Um, so the climate strikers, the Friday climate strikers came out. I think it's critical for the leader of our party to be out there on the ground. It's not just about organizing programs, but I was there on the first day on the legislature steps in Victoria when the young Friday climate strikers had their, held their first rally. It was a pouring, it was pouring rain. There were about eight of them. They had their parents and grandparents there, some of them. And because I was there on the first day and because we had all these young Greens come into the campaign, we created this sense of family and togetherness and community. And that was, as far as I'm concerned, the biggest success on our campaign was our Young Green program. Let's make it a national program and let's make sure that our leader understands this. I have four daughters, Ingrid. I understood when I had to just step back, <laughs> keep my mouth shut and follow them because they knew better. And they often did know better, Ingrid. And it was one of my daughters, Sarah, who helped to organize that. And she'd often say, dad, just leave it to us. <laughs> and so we would. And I think it, that's the kind of leadership style I offer. I don't need to be front and center in the spotlight. I'm very happy to be behind other leaders and supporting other leaders, especially our young leaders, because they need space. They demand space. And, you know, as a 57 year old uh, white man, it's not my place always to be at the front. It's often my place to be supporting other leaders. And that's what I'd love to do, by the way, with the other eight candidates in this race. If I'm the leader, my first call is going to be to them and say, how can you stay in the party and be a, fully realize your hopes and dreams for the party? And how can I help you make that happen? It'll be the same thing for them as with our Paint the Island Green program. That last little bit was not your question, Ingrid, but it relates closely to my leadership style. Did you want to I mean, follow up, Ingrid, on that? Did you have a follow up? Well, I'm just saying like, if we could um, attract uh, young people to actually come out and vote, and they will come out and vote if, if they see uh, younger people in leadership roles. Like for instance, you know, I'm older and I'm, you know, the president of the CA and, and the CEO of the EDA and people look at me and think, oh, you know, like there's an old person there. <laughs> you know? But yeah. I don't know how to get these young people involved. I just don't have any luck. Yeah. We have one young green in our EDA, but that's it. And she's like only 16. So. Yeah, well, you know, it's key to get started. I think campaigns are a great time to get started. Going out knocking on doors with the Young yeah. Greens is a, time, is a time for togetherness. Like literally, we used to play games, who's gonna run to the doorbell first? And, uh, and you know, creating a sense of team and family and togetherness is at the heart of it. I also think there's a role for the national party. Like this is now a program that could be rolled out in any riding. And Ingrid, if you want, send me an email, davidmerner at shaw.ca, and I'll send you the written material on how we did it, and mm -hmm. that'll help you. And if you want me to introduce you to my daughter, Sarah, I'm happy to do that because really having a young person leading it makes it so much easier, as you said. And there are young Greens across the country, 25 of them to be precise, who would be very happy to share their experiences and help you build in your writing. Thank you. Okay, uh, Stacy, you have a question? Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks, David, for joining us. Uh, we, one of the questions that I have on my mind is that, um, you know, recently, of course, there has been a really strong Black Lives Matter movement. And one of the weaknesses, I think, that has existed within the Green Party is a lack of diversity. Uh, and so I'm wondering how it is that you plan to address that. Thank you for the question, Stacey. In my career, I mentioned earlier my deep commitment to Indigenous justice and working on Indigenous justice. But my last 10 years, I was responsible for human rights in British Columbia at the Ministry of Attorney General. So we brought in legislation, the amendments to the BC Human Rights Code. We, cre we created a, a BC Human Rights Commission. We started the consultations on that and really rolled that out. And the reason I tell you this story is I believe we need a leader who understands human rights from the ground up but also understands how to lead it from the top down so that you create a joint effort from our members and from the leadership and the team. And the structural changes I would make based on my experience in human rights and indigenous justice is we need co-leadership at the top of our party. We need to have diversity built into the leadership model 
And I'm a fan of two leaders. The German lead, uh, Greens do this. The New Zealand Greens do this. The Alberta Greens just changed their constitution to do it. If we build in diversity at the, re at the top, that will start the leadership from the top that's essential to make this happen. I also believe that on the ground, every single one of us needs to take responsibility. So if everybody on this call, again, went out and said, I know a person of color, I know a black person, I know an indigenous person, I'm gonna go and talk to that person and just try and sell them a membership. Say we're in the most important decision-making phase in our last 14 years, deciding who the leader will be. Come in, join us, we want you to be part of it. And maybe you'll be interested in coming to one of our executive meetings. We always have coffee and cookies or we serve food and it's fun and you'll get to see how our party operates. Come and just join us. You don't have to join the executive, just come and be an observer. If every single one of us took this step, that would transform the party right away. We would really diversify on the ground. So if you have the leadership at the top, you have people on the ground doing the right things and working hard, remember that 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration, then what we can do is create a new culture inside our party. And I deeply believe that to have a new culture, you need the right kind of empowering leadership. You need leaders who don't have to be in the spotlight, leaders who will be followers of others. So I'd love to recruit. We have a fantastically diverse team of nine really amazing leadership candidates, and I'd like to keep them all in the race and empower them to be the front line of our diversity work to go out and recruit others, to make sure that our codes of conduct and our staff training and our recruitment of candidates and volunteers really represents the full diversity of Canada. That's how I would crack the code, Stacey, on changing the culture inside our party. So we're much more wel welcoming, not just to people of color, indigenous people, black and so on, but young people, as Ingrid indicated in her question, welcoming of people who are economically marginalized as well, people who just find it hard to participate in our party because it takes time and it's costly. Those, those are some of my priorities as a leader. And on day four, after I'm elected, I will get on the road to recruit candidates and recruit volunteers that represent the full diversity of Canada on an EV. Thanks, Stacey, for the question. Okay, uh, David Weaver, uh, you have a question. Yes, thank you, Teresa. Like so many people in this gathering, we are in, very passionate about having electoral reform move us to having proportional representation. And um, having been so deeply involved with Fair Vote that you have been, David, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about you, that you have that social justice vision to, to electoral reform. But I, I would like you to explain, as a leader for the Green Party, how you would approach it uh, to try to increase the likelihood that we can actually get to that goal of having proportional representation. Thank you, David, for the question. And I see that proportional representation priority for our party as one of our top two or three priorities. I, obviously, the climate emergency is number one, but I really believe proportional representation is critical. And as you mentioned in your question, I served on the board of Fair Vote Canada for seven years. As many of you know, that's our leading proportional representation advocacy group in Canada. I see that Jennifer Ross is on this uh, call. Jennifer, nice to see you here. Jennifer as well was on the board with me and has done yeoman service for, for the Fair Vote Canada group. Um, and I'm deeply committed to this. I've been deeply committed to proportional representation since I was, uh, since I was uh, a university student. Um, it is tricky in this current uh, situation uh, for us to push the agenda forward. I believe, uh, and this is controversial, but I believe the time for a referendum before we bring in legislation is over. We should not be campaigning on a referendum anymore. And this is more controversial. Our Green Party policy last time, I know because I wrote it, uh, is that we should have a constituent assembly before we bring in legislation. And I'm no longer a fan of the Constituent Assembly, and I hope Greens uh, will hear me out on this. I understand how wonderful Constituent Assemblies are. They helped us in BC to get in uh, the best result in terms of referendums on proportional representation in our history. But I believe Quebec has set the example. They've gone straight to legislation. They've used their legislative process in their legislature as a way of consulting fully 
on the model of proportional representation and so on. And we've already had an example of how parliamentary processes can work, especially if there's a minority government situation. And so if we have the balance of power, David, what I would say is one of our conditions of supporting a majority, a government, a, the governing party is that we move to directly to legislation and then a fully consultative process through the House of Commons Parliamentary Committee responsible for this legislation. Uh, and then we move on to pass the legislation after really listening to Canadians. I'm a fan of going direct to legislation because if we don't do that, we will continue to encounter the politicians putting their self-interest on being re-elected ahead of the interests of Canadians who in the polls say clearly over and over again that they want a fair and just uh, democratic system in Canada. Thank you for the question, David. Um, so why, why you and what differentiates you from everyone else? Teresa, thank you for the question. Why me? Four quick points. Uh, first, we need a leader who is perfectly bilingual, who can win debates in the leadership debates, who can convince people on the ground to vote for the candidate. We need somebody who can really connect with people in New Brunswick, which is a huge growth area, in Quebec, where we should be winning seats, and Eastern Ontario, and maybe even in San Boniface, Manitoba. <laughs> I'm a real fan of grassroots campaigning, and to do that, you really need a leader who will get out on the ground and work with each candidate. Uh, I've done this in Memramcook Tantramar entirely in French. I've done it in Ottawa Vanier entirely in French. It didn't come up in Guelph, <laughs> but I would have in Guelph if it had been necessary. Uh, and I'm the kind of leader who can win seats in Francophone Canada by winning the leaders' debates and winning votes on the ground. Secondly, I'm the only candidate in this race who can actually win the seat uh, they ran in in 2019. Uh, we came a close second. We will win next time. Certainly we'll win if I'm leader. And that'll save us a problem. If we have a leader who can't win a seat, that creates a problem for us rather than a solution. Third, I'm the only candidate who has campaigned in all parts of Canada, Atlanta, Canada to BC on winning green campaigns, not just federally, but provincially as well, as in New Brunswick and as in Mike Schreiner's writing in Guelph, uh, and also municipally in BC, we have municipal greens. So I have deep experience in winning campaigns in the Green Party more than any other candidate. And I think campaigning skills is, is an important thing. Lastly, I understand the Green Party in a deep way. Uh, and my view is what we need as a leader in the Green Party is somebody who's a listener, somebody who's a builder, and somebody who's a uniter. And I believe I'm unique in that way as well. When you compare me to the other eight leadership candidates, I don't need to be in the spotlight. I've mentioned this before. I don't need to be sort of center stage, you know, performing. I'm very happy to be a conductor, uh, an orchestra conductor, a big band conductor, whatever you want, who enables the other soloists, the fantastic soloists to shine and who makes sure that we're playing together uh, that we're playing in tune and that we're playing the same tune, but it doesn't have to be about me being the star of the show. And I really think with this fantastic leadership crew we have, that's the kind of leadership that will pull our eight other candidates together and that will empower our grassroots volunteers and enable our party to excel. This is a little bit corny and, and I hope nobody minds, but I love the idea of help other people excel um, not just because it's the right idea, but because it spells hope. If you spell out help other people excel, the first letters. I love this idea that if people have the hope of being able to excel inside our party, they'll stay with us and they'll work really hard. And that's the kind of leadership I offer. And I believe it's a unique message and it's unique to my personality. Last point, I mentioned my career in the justice sector. I was a dispute resolution specialist for the last 10, 15 years of my career, both in Ottawa uh, at the Minis Department of Justice in Ottawa and in BC at the Ministry of Attorney General. And I think those dispute resolution skills, those abilities to pull people together is part of what I offer in, in, as unique skills in this leadership race. Thanks for the question, Teresa. <clears throat> 
You're muted, Teresa. I see. Do that. Um, and another question uh, that's uh, come in is, who is someone that inspired you growing up and what lessons did they teach you? Thank you for the question. I'm going to have to think about that. That's the first one that's been asked. Um, so this is this is uh, this is a, a bit of an obvious answer. I hope you guys don't think it's uh, too obvious. I was a total fan. I was I, I love hockey. I still play twice a week in in the winter time and in the summertime I play once a week. Sometimes it's three times a week in the winter. So since I was a kid, I thought, yeah, my goal is to become an NHL hockey player. And by the time I was about 15 or 16, I realized, no, that's never going to happen. <laughs> I'm just not going to. But as a kid, I used to watch Wayne Gretzky and the Edmonton Oilers. I was born in Edmonton. And uh, uh, Gretzky was a real uh, hero to me. And I realized this is a, a typical Canadian kid story. But maybe the reason why is, is something that would interest you. Wayne Gretzky had more assists uh, in, in his career than any other hockey player had assists and goals. So in terms of total points, if Wayne Gretzky had never scored a goal, he would still be the leading uh, scorer in Canadian hockey history, right? And I just love that fact about Gretzky is people see him as this fantastic goal scorer, you know, um, nobody's ever equaled him. But it's the fact that he made everybody else around him so great that was really inspiring. And I play hockey the same way. I actually don't have a natural goal scoring ability, but I love to set other people up. I get as much pleasure as they do. Two of us get the pleasure. And so that's one of the things I like to do on my teams, especially if I'm playing on teams where folks aren't quite as good. It's really fun to set other people up. That's a bit of a long answer, but uh, that's my answer. Um, you mentioned earlier, uh top three priorities, and it was uh, proportional representation and uh, the climate emergency. What's uh, number three on that list? For me, it's about social justice. And so I think our top social justice issue is the guaranteed livable income. It's, it's a no brainer for me. And I think it's going to be really, really popular in the next election because Canada, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit has already been part of our culture now. And it's helped so many people across Canada. And they'll see the benefit of a universal program, much less expensive than the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, and much more fair. And lastly, um, as somebody who's worked in government, I think it's really important. It's much easier to administer one single universal program than all these patchwork programs, you know, EI and welfare benefits and so on. So I think that Will be, would be my third top priority is campaigning hard on the guaranteed universal income. You know, for nine, for sorry, for seven percent of our 2019 budget, we would eliminate poverty in Canada. What a deal, right? So I think that's a really compelling um, campaign platform for us in the next election is campaigning hard on the guaranteed livable income. And then I think, um, I don't know, one, it, unless there's any more questions um, from the floor. Uh, last question I have for you, is there anything else that you would like us to know that we haven't uh, touched on? Um, one of the things I, I love to do on these calls is just to see what people think about that co-leadership idea. Um, and there's another element to it as well. I'm really committed to diversity in the party. And one of the things I'm interested in is how do we enable Indigenous people, people who are marginalized from Canadian politics for economic reasons, to get into our party and play a role? What would people think about, first of all, the co-leadership idea? And then secondly, the idea of creating space on our federal council for one or two Indigenous people. We do this for young Greens, right? We have a young Greens council and the two chairs are on our federal council. Um, what would people think about creating space for maybe one or two Indigenous representatives who were elected by Indigenous Greens, uh, self-identified, uh, and maybe also create space for one or two representatives of economically marginalized Canadians? Um, the, def the definition of that would be tricky. Uh, identification of a team with a safe space for those communities would be di difficult. But I'm interested just in the concept 
Um, so maybe if you're comfortable with this, anybody who wants to come onto the screen by uh, bringing, coming off your uh, blocked video to, to, and, and showing your face, because we'll do a little quick poll here. First of all, on co-leadership, uh, the arguments, pros and cons are, you know, it's sharing, it's increasing diversity, sharing power, getting away from the one person party, the one person leader mentality, that's the pros. The cons are, it might be confusing to the media, confusing to, the, to, to members who's accountable. Uh, so those are like a 10 second view of the pros and cons. This is not a scientific poll and I'm not gonna hold you to it, but who likes co-leadership, thumbs up. Okay, who doesn't like it? Thumbs down, bad idea, confuse everybody. Thank you for your honesty, I appreciate it. And who's sort of in the middle? Sort of wondering, you know, not sure. We'd have to, get the, the devil's in the details. Yeah. Yeah, I think no, Julian no, might have sure. a comment yeah. or question. So this, this is representative of our Green Party generally. Uh, a lot of people are keen on it. A lot of people wanna know the details and there are quite a few people who are anxious about it. Don't worry, if we ever went for this, which I hope we do, we'd have a constitutional convention. It has to be an amendment in the constitution. Some leadership candidates say it doesn't. We've done the leader work, we've done the work and we would need a constitutional amendment. So there'll be lots of time to debate this. Secondly, on creating a space on our federal council for indigenous people, marginalized people, um, maybe one or two seats, maybe one, let's say one, it'll make it easier uh, just to be clear. Um, what would people think? Again, just very high level, uh, good idea, bad idea, or middle. So good idea, who, who would put their thumbs up for creating space for uh, people who are underrepresented in our party? All right, bad idea, thumbs down. This will create a ghetto, you know, we should just elect people by merit. No, I don't see any thumbs down. In, in the middle, devil's in the details. We, we need to figure this out, yeah. <laughs> It's often the same people, uh, many of them have had legal training, who say uh, <laughs> we have to know the details before we vote on these things, and I totally respect that. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the poll. You know, your, your call here, our call here together is quite representative of the other calls and the in-person meetings I've had. When I started traveling across Canada in February and March, I thought, I don't think this co-leader idea is going to really fly with Greens. I was amazed at how popular it was. I thought people would say it's confusing um, and the Green Party is already seen as, you know, a bunch of weird flaky people and David, you're just one of them by advocating this idea. <laughs> but I actually am very encouraged by, um, by the support for the idea. So we'll see how far it goes. It'll be up to the membership. You all know leader doesn't set policy, doesn't determine the constitution. It's up to the membership. And if I'm leader, we'll come back to this again as something that uh, we should really consider carefully. We should look at the New Zealand and German models and other, other jurisdictions and then figure out co-leadership. Same with the idea of greater representation on our federal council. Sorry, that was a bit of a long detour, but I really appreciate the feedback. Uh, Teresa, did you have more questions or do you want another detour? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have more questions. Um, okay. I didn't know, Julian, you had put up your hand at one point. Did you have uh, something to say on those? Well, I, 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 I think David hit on a point, just maybe it's my experience from being involved that I'm, I'm in the middle on a lot of things. Also, I think realism is, is important. And there's this, there's a, I call it a, a sickness. It's an over consultation sometimes, and it, and it leads to nowhere and, and, and too many priorities become no priorities. And we see that right now particularly with what I'm involved in with long-term care, there's so many pieces instead of one or two or three key messages. All right, so I was struck with what David said about that, and that's, that's uh, leadership to come out and say something that might not be uh, all that well accepted. And I, I just really, uh, I, I don't mean to be disparaging at all, I, I consider myself an advocate and activist is okay in my, that's my world. It can, but get, it's to win some seats. It really is. I, and I hate, you know, I, I use my experience and sometimes that's not even a good thing because you get a little crusty, but, but the realism is, is that you want to win seats. You yeah. need to win seats. And, 
Yeah. And you, even the election map, what I in 215, I knew what I wanted to do. What we did was totally different. And, uh, but I, that's all I can say. I just, I, well, thank I, you, Julian. Even, I, I agree with you 100%. And, you know, there are people on this call. I'm one of them. Um, Mike's another, David's another, who ran in this uh, election last time. And it was so disappointing to see how we got off message. And this campaign was perfect. The 2019 campaign was perfect for a focused message on we must take on the climate emergency. It's our number one priority. The science is clear. And uh, it would have been a resonant campaign. But instead, we started talking about abortion. We spent about five days talking about our position on abortion. Remember the racists in New Brunswick distraction, which is about three or four days? Separatists running for us in Quebec, another two or three days. We spent way too many days off message uh, and distracted in the last campaign. And we need a leader who will follow the message and stick to the message in a disciplined way and bridge back to the key issue facing human civilization, which is the global climate emergency. Yes, we are a party of social justice, but that ties in very much to the global climate emergency. It's all about sticking together and enabling us all to transition into a new economy, uh, a new way of powering our economy. So I agree, Julian, we need more message discipline. And one of the reasons we thought we were going to win this riding, you know, two weeks, 10 days before we were ahead in the polls. And then we started sliding because I think Canadians started looking at us and they said, you know, are the Greens ready? Are, are, are they really a serious political party? Uh, how has their leader performed in the election? Are they disciplined? Do we understand what they're campaigning on? And if the answer to those questions are, well, maybe, or somewhat, then we will continue to underperform as a political party. I, I agree. I agree totally. And I only say this, David, like just to be a transparent and 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 is is that i haven't even made a decision yet but what i'm hearing uh is where realism actually is going to count and i always go back to yes we are a party uh, the greens are a party of the environment but if we have no economy i know where people will vote i just i just know where they're going to vote and yeah. i think that's a real big uh, uh consideration so julian here's a Here's my point on that, my last point, because I realize we want to let others in. But um, I was born in Alberta. I, much of my family is still in Alberta. I have a daughter who's a young doctor, first year doctor at Foothills Hospitals in Calgary. And, you know, I have a cousin who's a welder who does a lot of work in Fort McMurray. He lives in Wetaspring. And what I want to be able to do is say to folks in Alberta, we have a plan, an economic plan that works for you. It's not just some crazy green scheme. It's a plan that will actually work for you. And it's a transition plan built on what the Al Alberta NDP did with coal. They moved off coal. It's about what the town of Raymond, Alberta has already done. They've gone all solar in their municipal infrastructure. If Raymond, Alberta can do it, so can the rest of the country. And we want to make sure through our free tuition program that, you know, the welders and the drillers and others in Alberta move on to the kinds of work on solar and geothermal and run of river hydro the renewable plant, and they can build this east-west grid for us too. Uh, so I'm really keen on an economic message that resonates in Alberta, because if it resonates there, it'll resonate across Canada for sure. Okay, uh, and I think the last question uh, will be uh, Mike, if you want, or... Sure, I'd be glad to, I know we're just about You're just on mute, Mike. Can't hear you. Right, sorry. Um, I know we're sh short on time, so maybe David, if you could answer this in about 30 seconds. Uh, the reason I chose the Greens is because of the integrity of the party. And uh, that was a, a, one of the key messages that I ended up talking with a lot of people at their doors over the past year about. And a lot of that comes down to what, what we saw last, last night in, the, in, our, in our provincial government. We had a, an MPP who voted against her party and was kicked out within an hour. And so if you could briefly touch on, um, I know we've spoken about this before, but I think for others to hear about your approach to whipped votes and to ensuring that uh, representatives rep represent their community first and the party second, where do you, yeah. where, where do you stand there? 
I am totally for uh, the current situation, which is not whipping votes. I think it's very important to leave scope for our uh, representatives to vote their conscience and vote for what their constituencies are telling them. It's happened before in the Greens on firearms. You know, we have Bruce Heyer voting one way, Elizabeth May voting a number, another way in a caucus of two. I'm a fan of that. I don't see that as a problem at all. I see it as a good thing. Yeah. And so I'm a real fan of protecting conscience and integrity of conscience. I'll just say one last thing. This might lose me a few votes in this call, but many of you know this. I was a federal liberal for 30 years. And the reason I left was because of the lack of integrity. And I really feel that that's, that's a, a critical thing for Greens is the fact that we are a party of ethics and integrity. The polling shows that. P Canadians can see it. And what we need is a leader who's deeply committed to ethics and integrity. And I'm, I'm a real fan of empowering our members of parliament, the many members of parliament we'll, we'll have after the next election to vote their conscience. I'll just say one last thing, which is Thank that you. uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Mike, for the question. Teresa, I'm very happy to stay on as long as the last person on this call wants to stay on. So what I'll do is I'll do a short two minute conclusion if you're okay with this. And then anybody who wants to leave is free to leave. And anybody who wants to stay is free to stay. If no one stays, that's fine. But I'll stay on until the last person leaves. Is that okay, Teresa? Is uh, that yeah, that uh, sounds good. And uh, I'll also uh, put in my thank you to thank you, David, and uh, thank you everyone else for uh, coming out and uh, participating in uh, democracy here and uh, listening uh, to uh, David. So thank you. Thanks very much. I also want to say thank you to the organizers. It takes a team to make these calls come together. I was sorry about the confusion at the start. We were on two different calls, but I think everybody came together, which is fantastic. And that works very well because that's the key theme of my leadership campaign. <laughs> <laughs> we want to pull everyone together. We want to come out of this leadership race with nine candidates working together in the same direction, campaigning in nine different ridings, winning their seats, we want people in your area, which is a total winnable area. We have candidates on this call who will win next time. I am 100% sure convinced. We need a leader who can win his own seat. I will win my seat here in Esquimalt San Estuc. On a besoin d'un leader qui est capable de faire campagne dans nos deux langues officielles, sans hésitation, courageusement, et encourager notre parti, uh, exiger que notre parti devienne un parti totalement bilingue. That's the kind of leadership I'll offer, somebody who's got a lot of experience, who's willing to listen, who's willing to build, and who's willing to empower others. Thank you, everybody, for coming on. Feel free to stay. Any of you who have to leave, I'll say a goodbye, and thank you for coming on. So great to see you. And um, I'm happy to have either questions typed into the chat box or uh, just wave your hand, and I will pick on you for your the question. Merci encore tout le monde. Thank you very much, everyone who wants to leave now, and who would like to ask a question? <laughs> Julian, don't hesitate. <laughs> I mean, I, my mind's been going for years, actually. And part of it is what should have been, could have been, can be, because there's always the past, but you learn from the past, but you don't get stuck in the past. You learn from it. I really <clears throat> come back to the reality of politics and the reality of what I believe to be authentic uh, Canadians, Sh just trying to survive, but not to make that an empathy thing. Uh, people will vote for a party that actually admits that they're a party. And what what I used to hear and still do at times is we're better than everybody else. That's the holier and thou statement. When I was involved with the Greens Party and it was probably the best job I ever had. And I left on my own accord and nothing was malice. I just was time to go do something else. Yeah. And, but I used to hear that and, I, and then I would watch and I saw, well, I worked for the Liberals. Somebody's trying to bring in their friend that's no different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I, I thought about things and, and, and really the admission that people will vote for a, a, a party and a leader that leads uh, is critical. And I can't, this, 
activist uh, uh, piece is what harms the party. And I don't, don't want to say anything demeaning to that. No, I, you, I, get, uh, I get it, Julian. I understand what you're saying completely. And I think we, we have so many strong activists in the party. And we have two fantastic candidates in this race. One is a socialist, the other is an eco-socialist, right? And they're real activists. They want to storm the barricades. And I really respect them for their honesty and their passion. And I think that we can pull together, you know, eco-socialists, socialists, and people who are more fiscally conservative together. I really believe that we are united by our focus on the climate emergency. People see the science. They know time is running out you know, five, six, seven years maybe before climate change is irreversible. Probably Can I less. jump in on that, David? Yeah, probably less. And just one thing, I'll just finish off. And so if we don't start right now, all together, we are in serious trouble. And, and I think that'll unite everybody, the activists, the more fiscally conservative and everybody and pull them together. Yes, over, over to you. So I think this follows up from what Julian was sort of suggesting. I've been enamored by a phrase of late, David, and the phrase is this. We should stop bringing facts to a story fight. That is, we are finding ourselves in the midst of a story fight and we have been throwing facts and data at people for years and years and years. Yeah. To continue to say the science is in, the science is clear, is not a message that works anymore. It never did. Mm -hmm. People don't like facts, they like stories. And so my question that I was going to ask you a little bit earlier on mm -hmm. is what's the restorative positive story that you're going to tell as the leader of the Green Party that will, will get people to say, yeah, I'm coming on board. What I'll say is that Canada needs to be a leader for the planet to change. And we know that Canada can be a leader. Other countries are doing it right now. It's not hard. We look at, if, even in our own country, here in my riding, the South First Nation has got completely off diesel generators. They're on to solar. And Southwest Vancouver Island is a very rainy place, but they're powering their whole reserve through solar and batteries. Um, and if we can do it here in Southwest uh, Vancouver Island, we can do it across the country. And like I said earlier, the you know, town of Hinton, Alberta is leading the country in geothermal en energy. They have all these orphan oil wells, they're converting them to geothermal power sources. We know we can do it. It's not about engineering. What it's about is a lack of political will. It's a lack of focus. It's a lack of clarity around what needs to happen. It's not that we don't know how to do it. We know. And I totally agree with your point that it can't be about facts and it has to be about stories. Uh, let's tell the stories, especially the success stories that are already underway in Canada and around the world uh, and emulate those stories and keep repeating them in a disciplined kind of way. We had a 92 page platform last time. Some of you may even have read it. I did, <laughs> but I think uh, your point and Julian's point about what are your three priorities and keep hammering those priorities and showing how they will make the lives of Canadians better uh, on the ground every day. That's the kind of story we need to tell. And I also think I disagree with you on one thing. I do think educated Canadians do care about the science. I really believe educated Canadians will tune into that. It may not be like 90% 90, 90 of Canadians. They need to hear a positive story. But part of the story is this is an emergency. And we know it's an emergency, not because we're the party of the sky is falling, not because we're the party of no, not because we're the tree huggers and granola eaters. It's because the science says it. It's because the experts are saying it. And it's because the fossil fuel industry is saying it itself. They're disinvesting now from fossil fuels, from the tar sands, and they're moving into renewables with billions of dollars. So let's listen to the experts here, and the scientists are some of the experts, but then also let's tell a story that resonates on the ground. So thanks for the question. Who's I have next? to agree with Stacy. <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've heard evidence-based forever, and, yeah. and that's, that, that is losing its, its cloud. I know what you're saying, though. I agree yeah. totally. It's One of the reasons evidence-based is so just, important just inside our party is because if you want to manage the activists, if you want to pull people together on nuclear power, say, you have to go to what does the science say? What does the evidence say? If you don't go there, you get lost with people making up their facts. And it's a way of pulling in the activists who are, you know, hardcore for nuclear power. You say, okay, well, what's the science on that? The anti-vaxxers, you know, the, uh, that's another group. They tend to be green, but we have to fight for the evidence and the science. So I'm a strong believer 
in evidence-based policy and science. Those of you who don't believe in that, well, there are lots of other candidates to support in the race. Over to you. I, I just I just have to say, because Julian mentioned something and then someone mentioned in the chat uh, that they agree with Stacey. There's two people here and she is the most important person in the Green Party uh, of the two of us, but she doesn't want to have my opinion mixed up with hers. So <laughs> just, let's just make sure that was me that said that's great. And that's James, if for people who don't know. <laughs> Thanks, James. Stacey. Uh, appreciate you, Claire. Stacy, I hope you're not embarrassed. James is making some very good points there. <laughs> uh, She's embarrassed for other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Other questions or comments? Uh, I find that the second half hour and then the third hour are always the best. <laughs> so, any other questions or comments? I'm, I'm curious about uh, what you mentioned about the east-west uh, electrical grid um, and uh, the battery backup uh, like to support that. Yes. Can you go into a bit more detail of what your vision is about that? I'd be really delighted. Thank you for the, the question. The east-west grid is really critical for us getting off um, fossil fuels. One of the reasons is that to the extent we can decentralize our power generation, uh, to the extent that we're able to use run of river geothermal in these orphan wells and in other drilling projects um, and solar, local solar, we really have a chance of making rapid change. Uh, run of river hydro is another one I should have mentioned earlier. So these are local projects that can be built up very quickly we have the engineering knowledge and the skill to do it. And they're not massive infrastructure projects in themselves. And then if they can connect up to an east-west grid, um, which has already been built, like Quebec Hydro has massive experience in this, Ontario Hydro as well. It's not like we need new engineering. Uh, we just need political focus uh, and money to make it happen. Uh, so it's very doable. It's something that's already being done across our country. Uh, it's just that, we operate often in silos. Ontario doesn't buy energy from Quebec for crazy reasons. Um, Manitoba is completely disconnected from Ontario. And if we can just resolve these differences, money is part of the problem, political focus and, and will is another part of the problem. Um, that will really transform how we uh, distribute energy, but also how we generate it through local projects, small scale projects. Um, and we know from uh, recent experience in Australia, Tesla has a fantastic new battery farm, which is being run by a French company in Australia right now. We have the storage capacity now, the technologies there to make uh, all these renewable uh, projects viable. Uh, and especially if we have a national distribution system, it solves the problem of intermittency in renewables, right? So that's a bit of a long answer to your question, but I do see it as partly a political, this goes back to James's comment and Julian's comment. It's a fantastic story. It's the story of our national railway. It's, it's, it's the story of how Canada was built. And so the story should be around, we're gonna build a new Canada. And we've done it once before with the railway. Um, and sure there were terrible consequences for the environment, for indigenous people and so on. But let's do it having learned those lessons and rebuild a new Canada um, with this, a new nation building project, the largest job creation project in Canadian history. I think there's a story to be told there that's very inspiring. It's not just about intermittency, intermittency in the engineering, right? <laughs> so, thanks for the question. And, and on the political side, uh, a lot of energy policy is determined on the uh, provincial side, right? Um, yeah. So how, how does that, how, how can you uh, pull that together from the, the federal side? The, the great thing the federal government has is spending power. Uh, I think the spending power is the key. And so we say to Ontario Hydro and Quebec Hydro and uh, all the other, BC Hydro is another one. We say, we can help you, but this is the only way we're going to help you. Uh, the other thing is you can use a hammer. Uh, the environment is um, a federal jurisdiction as well as a provincial jurisdiction. And so we can start making it difficult uh, for the BC hydros and others of the world when they want to dam up navigable waters or waters where fisheries exist. And we can say, you know what, we have a lot of levers uh, that can get you to do what we want you to do. 
and this is a national emergency and we're starting to pull all those levers now, right? So I, I think that there is a, a very powerful uh, role for the federal government and the federal government has a ton of levers, including unlimited, pretty much unlimited taxation powers, um, which can be applied. So it's a question of leadership focus and exercising the power the federal government does have. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question. Hi. Go for it. Thank you. Hi. It actually goes uh, goes with what you were just talking about, yeah. and um, with climate change. But of course, deforestation is a big issue for for climate change. And so we hear about how Canada is really rapidly increasing its deforestation uh, and our, um, our, our wood industry, logging industry is unsustainable. Then you go on the Government of Canada website and it says that these are all myths, that uh, our deforestation is actually decreasing, not increasing, and it is sustainable. Uh, but then we hear of all the things that are happening, especially out in BC, of, of logging, of, of old growth forests, and, and you're out there, there now. So what is true? What is myth? And um, I know a lot of this is provincial jurisdiction, but you were just talking about how, as the federal level, you can uh, override that or get involved with that. So what is the real scoop on deforestation and how can we address it so that um, we don't continue to deforest? Thank you, Angela, for your question. It really is a serious problem. Deforestation is a real problem. We're not planting enough trees to replace the trees that are now being logged across Canada. It's especially true here in BC, like you said. Um, more old growth forest is being logged here on Vancouver Island where I live than uh, under the Liberals. Uh, we have an NDP government that ran on the environment and yet they've totally broken their promise in terms of old growth forest, forest logging. You know, 90% of our valley bottoms uh, in Vancouver Island have been totally logged of old growth forest. It's a disaster. And this is true across the country. And uh, so I, I think it's clear what we need. And we actually campaigned on this in 2019. A lot of people, didn't pay attention to it, but I think it was critical. We proposed the most uh, extensive uh, replanting plan, tree planting plan in Canadian history. It's doable. We did our checks with the tree planters across Canada, especially in BC. And we need to be much more ambitious in terms of replacing all of these trees that are being logged. But the truth is, old growth forests take 200, 300, 1,000 years to grow. So as we log those forests, they are just not going to be replaced uh, in time to make a difference. Uh, but I do think the Green Party is on the right track with a very ambitious uh, uh, reforestation plan. These, these forests become carbon sinks and absorb carbon. And they're, I think they're essential to human survival. And we also need to look internationally, I think, Angela, at what's happening in other countries, especially Brazil right now, and how can we influence those countries to stop the rapid deforestation. It's happening around the world, South America, Africa, and so on. What can we do as a country, as part of our foreign policy and foreign investment to stop that as well? Great, great question. And sustainability as well globally, yeah. because it all, it all leads to pandemics as well when we rape and pillage the, national, the natural world, right? And it, That's right. Look at the situation we're in now. I think the yeah, Weirdly, the pandemic is a huge opportunity for us. You're exactly right. I and, know. But uh, yeah. <laughs> we've got to be campaigning. And this comes back again to James and Julian's question about what's our story. And a lot of our story should be about the pandemic and what we've learned from the pandemic. And we've yeah. learned that by, uh, by deforestation, by taking away habitat for wild animals, we are putting ourselves in serious danger. And the United Nations just came out with a report a couple of weeks ago saying, Pandemics are our future. As long as we continue to violate wildlife habitat in the way we are, it's just not sustainable and it has a direct impact on human health. Uh, so I love that and argument. And the economy. And the, it all ties in, right? Yeah. Everything ties in together. It's a holistic. Yeah. Yeah. That's what this I think story. I like your 
Yeah, this story has to be about how these things connect. You know, our job is to connect the dots for other Canadians in a comprehensive story that's easy to understand. Doesn't require a PhD to read it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and I think that story around the pandemic and our relationship with animals more generally is part of this. Like, it's not just wild animals, but it's our industrial scale livestock uh, uh, um, systems that we have in place now. Some would say industrial farming is really industrial scale livestock uh, breeding and killing. And how do we have that conversation in a way that connects with all Canadians? And it's part of a true story of we're in serious trouble if we don't make changes on these things in a holistic way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great question. Great answer. Um, <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, Mike Strafty, I think, has a, a follow-up question about uh, co-leadership. Great. Go for it. Please go ahead. I think you might be on mute now. David, at an earlier event, you made some comments about uh, having a co-leader that I was con somewhat confused by. And I actually, I emailed you at uh, five to eight, asking a question because the uh, email I got from your campaign a few days ago said this event started at eight rather than seven, so. Oh, yeah. sorry, Mike. Yeah. Anyways, I'm just curious. I'm not sure. I like a lot of what you say on a lot of issues, but but the language around uh, having a co-leader, I'm not sure how sellable that is. And I think the number one thing we want any new leader to do is to build a base and elect lots more green MPs. So can you say, uh, clarify what you're talking about there? Yeah, happy to do that, Mike. I really appreciate it. We we actually had a bit of a poll earlier on this call on co-leadership. We had a good chat about it, uh, but I'm happy to elaborate because we did it very fast. The first thing I'd say, and I said this earlier, is it's up to the members to decide whether this is a good idea or not. It'll require a constitutional amendment and that requires a vote of the, of the membership. So the power is in the hands of the membership to decide if this is a good idea. And what I also said earlier, and I totally get both sides of the argument, I understand people, like, and you'd probably be one, right, Mike, who would say, look, we need one clear line of authority. We, we, politics doesn't work by committee. <laughs> it works by strong, clear leadership and strong, clear messages, right? Um, and having two leaders will confuse people. Uh, it'll confuse the media. Um, I've had people say to me that, like my daughters, if they don't like my answer, they go to my wife. Well, if they don't like the answer of one leader, they'll go to the other one, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that's how the media work. I've, had, I've heard people say that to me. And so I totally get those arguments against it. Uh, the, member, the members want one leader, clear accountability. If things aren't working, for example, if we don't diversify our party, we know who's responsible, right? So I totally get those arguments. But when I traveled across the country, I was actually really surprised by how many Greens really love the idea. And the reason I think is they wanna get away from this old political party approach of top-down leadership. There's one boss, you know, runs the show, puts all their friends and, you know, allies into leadership positions in the party, creates a lot of top-down uh, dynamic. You know, a core value for us is participatory democracy. It's one of our six core values. And the co-leadership, by sharing power, we get a bit closer to that, you know, by putting the power in the hands of the members to, to lead the co-leaders. Um, we also create scope for diversity. And, you know, nothing against anybody on this call, but you just look at this call. It's true of all Green Party calls that I've been on. We're not a diverse party. And if you can build in diversity into the co-leadership, you create a sense that, you know what, the Greens are really working hard on that diversity issue that's been identified over and over again by our members and in this race. And so how do we create scope for diversity, create room? You know, uh, many people say they won't vote for me because... I'm a 57 year old white male and it's time for change. All the other parties have white leaders, white male leaders, it's time for change. And you know what, I get that. A couple of my daughters are saying, dad, you should make room for you know, a woman or wait, make room for a young person. And you hear this dynamic a lot in Canadian politics now. And I think that by having co-leaders, you can say to people, look, our core value is diversity. And it's about people from all different colors and genders and so on. 
So let's create scope for more of that in our leadership. And, you know, uh, sure, I'm a white male, but I'm also a person who's worked very hard in the Green Party, and so many white males have. Why would we rule out white males from the leadership of our party? But by creating a greater scope for diversity, we leave room for everybody. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think a lot of Greens like that. Just so you know, Mike, in the little poll we did earlier, I'd say it was about, I don't know, everybody else on this call can say, but I think it was probably about 60 or 70% in favor, about 10 or 15% who were against, and then probably uh, another 10% who were unsure. So that's been my feeling across the party, but I, I'm very glad to hear your viewpoints on why it's a bad idea. And I, and I really respect other viewpoints as well. That was a bit of a long answer, sorry. Well, I'd be happy to have you have as many deputies as possible, but you have to work within the system and what's possible. And I just think that that's a recipe for remaining with three seats rather than governing. Yeah, I respect that. And I think you're right. There are two co-leaders, uh, sorry, two deputy leaders, which is very different from co-leaders, good point. And so you could build in diversity that way too. Uh, and I, I respect that viewpoint as well, yeah. Thank you for the feedback and uh, feel free just to email me, davidmerner at shaw.ca if you'd like to continue this exchange by email. Um, one of my team has put together a bit of a paper, which I'd be happy to send you on how it could work. Um, and I'm not expecting to convince you, but you might just see some of the thinking on it. Uh, and I do really respect your point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Other, other questions or comments? Uh, we're at about an hour and a half. Uh, like I said, it always gets better in the second and third hours. So uh, I'm very glad to keep going with folks if they have questions or comments. I'll jump in one more time, <laughs> try not to, but uh, I, I actually like what Mike said. The poll, one of the things when in a leadership domain is a lot of people on a frame like this will want to almost be nice Canadians and agree. Uh, um, but nice is, is a term, it's a language domain thing. Um, there's leadership and I, I like what Mike was saying. I think he framed it better. There is a way in which you can de define or add definition to a co-leader or deputy leader with assigned roles and responsibilities, which I'm not sure I defined. I also think that what Mike is saying is, if this becomes a central debate into the next election, I can hear the media and I can hear the activists and I can hear the, the headlines and I can see the things as the parties in disarray. They now want two or three leaders. If I was offering political and policy advice, I would be saying that might be a transitional piece once we have a strong leader in place initially but then it will also allow for more room to gather more evidence to see how it really works. And there's always in the world, David, you know from your background, you can, you can push out trial balloons too. And that's part of politics. But to make that a, a piece that would go to a constitutional kind of forum debate now, um, I, I have to go on the side of what Mike is saying. Yeah, really good feedback. Um, the point about a constitutional debate and taking a long time and being a distraction and opening us up to criticism, these are really good points, really good points. One of the things on the constitutional debate and on our policy process inside the Greens is, I think we need to find ways to do this uh, much better. Uh, I think the COVID-19 lesson here is we can do things on Zoom, we can do things online, it's great to have these conventions where we all come together, but in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and cost to our members, you know, the idea of traveling from BC to Charlottetown for our convention in October is very discouraging for a lot of British Columbians. And there's gotta be better ways to have our policy debates and our constitutional debates in online fora and so on to make it easier for people to participate and not so expensive because it really, favors the well-off Greens, uh, that we don't have those systems in place. Thank you. Good points, Julian, and thank you for reinforcing Mike's points. I thought Mike's points were really good too. Uh, thanks, both of you. Other questions or comments? Uh, 
I just want to say thank you, and it gives me a lot to think about. And uh, as you know, I'm, I reiterate, I, I, I'm actually here because I will, I'm, I'm thinking a lot. That's so, great, yeah. Well, we have a, a preferential ballot, right? It's a ranked ballot, so you can rank all nine of us or just one of us. And so this exercise that we're going through, of speaking to each other, talking about our vision for the Greens and for Canada, is really a healthy process because we all get to, to rank uh, our leadership candidates from one to nine. And I think that's a very healthy process. Yeah. So if I may some, say something, it's just a comment. Yeah. Uh, David, I want to say I really like your confidence that you show and your positivity and your inclusion for diversity indigenous people and young people. Um, you're very strong in your Green Party convictions. Um, I kind of like what um, Julian was saying about the um, co-leader, even though I put up my hand to say, yeah, I like it, but he made some good points there. So we'd really have to think about that. Yeah. And the other thing I really like about you is you smile a lot, <laughs> and that's good. <laughs> and I'm going to say good night. Good night, Ingrid. Thank and you for the comments. I really appreciate the comments. And Thank see you. you in Cambridge in um, September. Yeah, I'm coming back there as soon as COVID-19 allows me to. I will be there. Uh, thanks, Ingrid. I, I mean, you. on Zoom in oh, September. Okay, in September. I'm, I'm, hoping to, <laughs> I'm hoping to do both a Zoom campaign and an in-person campaign in September and, and oh. travel through Ontario once oh. the restrictions are lifted. So I hope to see you okay. both on Zoom and in person. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, Doug Ford with his reopening the bars are going to get restrictions <laughs> lifted. I don't know if it's the same for you, Teresa, but here in BC, we're having a spike right now. The, the, the curve has gone up, so it may not be possible to travel, but I would love, yeah, I'd love Your to come. numbers actually got below 100 new cases a day. Yeah. Um, we never got there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, the, it's gone up in Ontario, gone up in BC, so it's quite worrying. And the last thing I want is to have a gathering of Greens where somebody gets sick, that would just be terrible. So I, I'm being very cautious about my plans, but we've been doing in-person meetings for three weeks here on Vancouver Island. We had an event in Salt Spring in my riding in Esquimalt in Victoria, and we socially distanced two meters apart. Everybody wears masks except for me, and I'm standing way away from everybody, and it's outdoors in a public park. So it seems to work, but people are nervous. And if the numbers start going up again, we won't go and do an in-person visits yeah. just and that's better for the environment anyway yeah yeah, yeah. um okay i think can i can i say yeah. something please yes yeah. um i'm new to watching these things and getting to know you people but it seems to me what i'm hearing is part of it is your your platform but it's also your dream of how you'd like to see the party evolve yeah. and certainly once you have a leader or we, uh, the Green Party has a leader, um, what you're going to focus on is not what you're talking about where we would have cool leaders and such. That's for the future. The thing that you're going to be focusing on in my mind and why, why you're talking about it now is because you're sharing it with people who are involved with, with what's going on within the party what you will be putting forth when there's an election will be the story. And that story will begin with the virus and the effects of it. Am I yes. correct in that? Yes. Um, this is a really different kind of campaign than the election campaign. And I think the points that, you know, Jane, James and Julian were making earlier about clear message, really, and a, and a powerful story, um, apply really an essential way to election campaigning. For leadership campaigning, I think it's a little different. People want to know what you're like as a person, um, what your values are, what you care about, you know, what your priorities are. So it's a different kind of campaign. You, the best leadership candidates are telling stories about themselves, you know, how, what their values are, what they've done. Um, 
and they're not just listing off a series of jobs they've done, that kind of thing. Or they're not, I, in my view, it's not about focusing on, you know, one issue or one ideology or, uh, I think it's about who are you as a person and how will you be a leader? And so I, I like to talk about, you know, being a listener, about being a builder, somebody who loves politics on the ground, somebody who's good at uniting, who has dispute resolution skills. Uh, and I hope what you hear from the other candidates when they're talking about their skills, it's about how they meet the needs of the Green Party. My feeling is those skills really match up well with what the Green Party needs. I, I think it needs a listener, it needs a builder, it needs somebody who's able to pull together, you know, the eco-socialists with the fiscal conservatives and everybody in one team. I think that's really important. So that's how I talk in, in the leadership races, but you'll have a chance to see them all, I think, coming up. And it'll be fun, I think, for you to have that opportunity. I've seen them a lot on the debates, but the debates don't work as well as this because it's all 30 second you know, answers and one minute conclusion. It's very hard to give a sense of who a person is in the, in, in the debates. These Zoom calls are way better. You, you'll get a feel for the person. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we thought we'd kind of do um, sort of both formats, try to have these nice one-on-ones and then also have some discussions um, between the two of you, between, not between the two of you, between all of you yeah. as well. That uh, it gives a nice it, contrast. I hope that answered your question, Mary Catherine. Is this your first leadership uh, campaign you've witnessed or seen? Uh, because in most, most parties, it's really different. <laughs> um, the Green Party is the only party I have ever decided to support. That's um, great. In any way, shape, or form. Yeah. And um, your values are my values. Uh, the people I meet here are who the people I want to be involved with. Yeah. Um, and I, I, so I, yeah, this is good. <laughs> That's great. I really appreciate that. I think the values uh, are what bring us together, you know, our six core values and, and also our way of being with each other. I really hope it's about cooperation and listening and um, valuing each other's opinions, even when we disagree with them. Uh, like that's how we learn. You know, Mike's points earlier about co-leadership are very good points and that's how we learn. And I'm always a big believer that by approaching things in teams and teams that have different perspectives, you're likelier to get better solutions. Um, and the diversity of opinion inside a party really is valuable. And that's very unlike the other parties that I've seen operating um, or that I've been part of. Uh, it's, it's, it's special about the Greens is this diversity of opinion and respecting the conscience of our individual members and our individual MPs. I, I really love that about the Greens. Any other questions or comments? I know I can usually count on Julian. <laughs> <laughs> Not I'll, give you one, I'll give you one more. I, 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 have the, I have the real fortunate, really fortunate to be able to speak with one individual in the U.S. His name is Mike McCurry, yeah. and he was the former press secretary to President Clinton and is rated one of the best. I have these Monday mornings with Mike sometime. It's almost like Tuesday with Morley, but nobody's dying. Yeah. Uh, but we do that. One of the things we talk about is he'll say, you know how it works. We'll say, I know how it works. And I'll say, in our, in our conversation, we talk about all sorts of things. And one of them was politics. And he will say things like, you know how it works. Or I'll say, Mike, you know how it works. Yeah. One of the worst things that happens to parties and the leadership and it's, it's, is that the advisors take over the agenda. And they become gatekeepers of who, who get who, what the what the leader he, hears and and listens to, and that really can, is challenging for a a a, a uh, leader. The question is, how do you get around that, David? So I don't know if any of you could see, but my wife came in and yeah. was talking to me just now because uh, 
the, the experience Mike had is uh, the experience of some other people who are trying to get into this call. Two uh, addresses went out for the Zoom call tonight. And so people were calling my wife to say, what, how do we come into this call? So we've sorted that out with my wife right now. I apologize for that. And I heard the start of your question, Julie, and I heard the very last part of it. Okay, but I'll just get, I'll do it really quickly. Yeah. The biggest part, problem with it, whether it's liberals, greens, anybody, a cocoon forms, you get the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers start to protect the leader. What happens is though, if you've got a really good gatekeeper and the, the, uh, what I call the gatekeeper, they allow yes well up to the leader I, 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 thank advisors you for the, actually become the ones that are telling them yeah thank you for the question around. that's all thank, i appreciate that question uh and thank you for repeating it it is a serious problem and uh and this is a sensitive thing to say but uh people say that a little bit about the green party as well now that uh, um we've had a party that's really focused on enabling our leader to uh, have a large role in policy and in hiring of staff and so on. It's one of the reasons I'm interested in the co-leadership structures because it makes it more democratic. It avoids this gatekeeper problem where everything moves to one person. Uh, and uh, I think that if you look at the German Greens and the New Zealand Greens with their co-leadership structure, they, the members really love it because it feels like a more democratic party. It doesn't feel like a dictatorship. And there's a tendency in parties with single leaders to create this palace guard around the leader. And, uh, and that is a real problem in most parties. You know, uh, you look at Justin Trudeau, he campaigned in 2015 on, you know, we will be, change how the Liberal Party works. We won't be a top-down party. Uh, we will ensure ethics and integrity and all that good stuff. And now you look at the fact that, you know, twice he's broken our Conflict of Interest Act. Uh, he has a palace guard around him, a very small guard who really controls what the whole government does. And it's endemic to our parties and our politics. And I, I'm really keen on trying to move away from that. I'm really keen on trying to figure out a different way of doing politics, which empowers others. And co-leadership makes it really hard for one person to be the dictator. Um, and I like that. So uh, I do respect other points of view on it, um, and, but I'm not a fan of tight gatekeepers. I'm the only person in the campaign campaigning to, you can call me anytime. Go to my website, davidmerner.com, and you can call me on my cell phone anytime. It's why it's been ringing tonight. I get a lot of calls. And if I don't answer, it's probably because I'm on the phone. Um, and anybody who wants to know, 250-514. 5507 is, is my cell phone number. It's on the website too. And I'm a real believer in avoiding gatekeepers. I do it on my own campaigns. I did, and, and it'll be hard to do as leader because what happens is people get on the phone and want to talk for hours, <laughs> especially in COVID-19 times. I've noticed that there are a lot of people out there very happy to talk on the phone, but uh, I will have to figure out a way to remain directly accessible to the members as the leader. One of the ways I'll do that is by having biweekly calls. Every second week, I'll have a call with our EDA, uh, our riding chairs, uh, to make sure that I'm connected to the ridings. And I'm thinking on the every other second week of having an open forum like this for all Green Party members so that there's a direct connection, no gatekeepers. It is a problem in politics. It may not be realistic because then you'll get all sorts of crazy people on the phone wanting to call you and talk for hours or get on the Zoom calls and uh, and say you know their pet peeve but if we can manage it right uh, i'd love to make sure to connect a direct keep a direct connection with the membership julian thank you thank you David, mike, good points you made. Okay. mike i see you want to jump in go ahead yeah i really appreciate your transparency so thank you for that yeah. and it, and in the in the spirit of keeping a transparent conversation going i will tell you that our, there are three three people in this household that will vote for somebody, but we don't know who it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, there has been a, a gift from our household to your campaign, Thank you. but also, to, but also to two other campaigns. Right. Uh, so could you spend a minute explaining why you should be at the top of the ballot as opposed to the other people that we like? 
Yes, I would love to do that. <laughs> Thank you for that question. A couple, uh, because uh, others came on earlier, they are going to hear this again for a second time, but I'm delighted you asked the question. Uh, first thing is I think it's really important to have a leader who has campaigned across our country, who really understands Greens from coast to coast. I'm the only leadership candidate who campaigned, who's campaigned from Atlanta, Canada, all the way to BC on winning campaigns, federal, provincial, and municipal. Uh, and I think that experience is really critical. Secondly, I can do it perfectly in English and French. I'm perfectly bilingual. And I think it's critical for the future of the Green Party. If we want to win seats in Quebec, in New Brunswick, in Eastern Ontario, we've got to have a perfectly bilingual leader who not only can win the leadership debates, but also convince people on the doorstep to vote Green. So sorry for the folks who've already heard this a couple of times. Third thing is I think it's really, really important to have a leader who wins his seat. Um, none of the other candidates in this race who ran in 2019 can win the seat they ran in. The data is clear on this. I can win my seat in Esquimalt Sanders Soup. We came a close second. And as leader, I will certainly win this seat. You can look at the data too, Mike, uh, but it's clear this is a, definitely a winnable riding and we will win next time if I'm the leader. Last point, and you heard part of this earlier, Mike, is that my sense of what the Green Party needs is it needs a leader who's not this kind of star power candidate who wants to be at the front of the stage in the spotlight. Um, what we need is somebody who's a uniter and a builder, you know, somebody who listens well, somebody who uh, really understands what's strong about the party and also what's weak about the party. Um, I haven't said this earlier, I'll say it now, there's fewer of us on the call. We only have about 20 ridings across con the country that actually are functional, 20 riding associations. Many of them are in your part of the world, but there's huge parts of our country, including in BC, where we have no ground game at all, no people on the ground. So we need a builder. And that's what I offer that's different from the other. I've built organizations from the ground up. I built this riding here in Esquimalt San Suk. I've been the CEO of four different riding associations across Canada. I know how difficult it is to build a sense of team and community and to win local campaigns. And I wanna be a leader for all the folks who are doing that. And I have unique uh, experience and unique skills in building. So those are some of the things that I think make me different from the other candidates. I'm not gonna put you on the spot, Mike, by saying, well, who are the other two? I could tell you what's different about me. That would be very unfair. And I've also made a commitment not to say negative things about any of the other candidates. So, <laughs> but I appreciate you giving me that chance, Mike. You came in late and I, I did start with that. That was the first thing I said is this is what differentiates me from the other candidates. Thanks for the question. Thank yeah, you. there's been a few people who've, uh, who joined later and missed that. So that's, uh, that's okay. You could, uh, Micah, yeah. ask that. That's great. Thank you. Sorry about the repetition for those of you who have been on for a while. It's good to hear. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, my wife was saying to me just now, yeah, there's still other people trying to figure out how to get onto the Zoom call. So. <laughs> There's a bit of confusion out there over, Angela made it over and my mom and dad are on this call, by the way, Darlene and Robert Murner. So they, fi they figured it out. So that's very good. Okay. Any last questions? Any last comments? It's late for you. I'm here at 10 to six, so it's not so bad for me. I was gonna say, and for the people who joined later, um, we are recording it and we will post it to uh, YouTube. Um, so uh, people who, missed part of the discussion so that's great yeah Teresa if you don't mind letting me know we'll put that on our website too and then people who missed the meeting because of we had a different uh, zoom link we'll put it we'll get them to see it as well okay sure that's great any last questions if not I'll, I'll just conclude by saying thank you if you guys are the hardcore of uh, the green party staying on this late I really appreciate it uh, davidmerner.com is my uh, website. You can get more information there. We actually have a lot of events posted coming up. Like I have an event every, every night for the next five days or six days. Uh, you can also see some of the archives. Uh, you can click on our events page and you go to archives and you'll see some of the recorded debates. The TV on O debate is on there. The French debate is on there. There's a bunch of really good debates on there. So come and take a look at the website. Like I said earlier, if you want to donate, I really appreciate Mike's donation and his family donations. 
no, matter, no amount is too small, so and it'll help us defray our costs. Uh, I really would love to come across the country and see folks in Ontario that I missed when I came through in March and had to turn around because of COVID-19. So I'm planning to come in August um, and then in September through Ontario, Quebec, and into Atlantic Canada. Thank you again, everyone. If you want to volunteer, click on the volunteer button, and I hope to see you again in person or again on Zoom. Really appreciate your time tonight. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you all. Thanks, Teresa, for organizing all this. Really appreciate it. Thank you, David. Bye now.